Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, seminar. I know it's not uh, the most ideal time for most of you, but um, thank you for coming. Uh, today we'll get, uh, hear a great talks from uh, our uh, uh, our collaborators at UC Santa Barbara. So I'm sure you will learn uh, so many new things to, tonight and uh, hope you'll enjoy this uh, seminar. So uh, let me first thank uh, our speaker for coming to this talk, Professor Shuji Nakamura, Professor Stephen Dembars, and Professor uh, Omesh Mishra. Uh, for those who don't uh, met them before, they are they are a big contributor to the development and the knowledge transfer of semiconductors uh, technology at uh, CACS and in Saudi Arabia for more uh, almost now ten years. Uh, today, we will hear uh, great talks from our uh, speakers uh, first uh, about the invention of blue LEDs and their lighting application from uh, Professor Shuji Nakamura, followed by uh, the applications of LEDs and laser in advanced displays and communication. And then we'll conclude with the gallium nitride for electronics as a major enabler for green energy and uh, power efficiency. But first, please allow me to introduce you to our uh, Joint Center of Excellence and uh, the activities that we are doing now at our uh, center. So uh, <laughs> since, since this uh, center was established 10 years ago, it was established in 2013 by CAC's current president, His Excellency Dr. Munir, and it focused on these uh, projects, visible LED, UV LED, uh, Li-Fi and green laser. So in uh, visible LED, where uh, we were very successful in getting great result, as you can see here, the result I'm showing for my, from my colleague uh, paper, uh, Abdullah Al Hassan. Uh, he got at that time the world record for green uh, LED efficiency, as you can see, more than forty percent with very nice TM image showing here uh, from his paper. But also we are working on the UV LED. UV LED is, is very important for water and air disinfections. And uh, with, uh, with hard work and dedication, we were able to get uh, to about now 10% efficiency, which uh, makes us very competitive worldwide in this uh, range and the disinfectional range uh, about from about 260 to uh, 280 nanometer. Uh, also, we we did uh, a lot of work on Li-Fi. Li-Fi is is uh, is uh, similar to Wi-Fi, but at much higher speed, which makes it great uh, solution for high speed communication and next generation of wireless communication. And uh, as you can see here, this is not our best result. We, but uh, as you can see, here, the published result is is four gigabit per second for uh, a direct modulation of uh, blue LED. But Steve, I don't think this is the best result, right? Uh, I think we got six. Six, six yeah, now. six. Okay, six gigabit uh, bit per second. Uh, also, we had, uh, fortunately, we had new capabilities here at CACS that allow us to do more uh, in our side for, uh, for the knowledge transfer and talent development. As you can see here, this is our new MOCVD system. It's uh, a MOCVD that can go up to 1200 Celsius and can accommodate three uh, substrate each two inch size. That system can be uh, can be used to build uh, and design and grow LEDs, lasers, uh, transistors, uh, and so on. Uh, the, here is a picture of our uh, clear room. It's a sixteen hundred meter square uh, class thousand clear room that we use it for uh, for uh, training and R&D. As you can see here, we, like, uh, we have a multitude of equipment that uh, can be used to develop uh, so many uh, products, uh, LEDs, lasers, solar cells, photodiodes, and uh, so on. And it can also accommodate up to uh, two inch, four inch, and six inch, various uh, sizes of wafers whether it's silicon, sapphire, silicon carbide, uh, gallium arsenide, or germanium. 
Uh, uh, last thing I want to show you is uh, highlights from our uh, uh, results this year. So 2023 has been a very successful result, a very, very successful year for us. We we were managed, our team at UCSB managed to get the first optically bombed UV laser, as you can see here. It uh, lays at about 351 nanometer, which is very important for the, for the application of clean energy. And also, we did, our team also at UC Santa Barbara just demonstrated a very high uh, mob electron mobility for hemp with about more than 1800 centimeter square per voltage second, which is already crossed our, uh, our milestone for the first year of this uh, project. So very, very successful and very promising for uh, next year also. Also, I'm happy to share that we just fabricated our first high power blue LED at uh, our clear room, as you can see here. It's a uh, very bright blue LED with the help of the growth at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So we thank our uh, collaborators there. And uh, here is here is our roadmap for the next three years. We want our we want talent development and we want knowledge uh, transfer. So. Uh, with these, with the, with building capabilities and the skills at these uh, technologies, whether it's a MOS CVD, high resolution X ray diffraction, electron microscopy, laser, HEMS, UVLEDs, high speed photodiodes, and so on. So, with this, with this uh, collaboration, we are able to accelerate and expedite the process of talent development and knowledge transfer of semiconductors in general and gallium nitride technology in particular. So that was a brief introduction of our uh, center. Now I'll hand over the, the podium to Professor Shuji Nakamura to tell us about more about the blue LEDs and how it's very important for the, for the real, realization of uh, high efficiency lighting uh, as we are uh, enjoying it uh, right now. So, Professor uh, Shuji, the podium is yours. Okay. Okay. Oh, can I do share screen? Yes. I, I, I'll stop the share screen from my side so you can do it. Okay. Okay. So uh, just before um, just before you start, Shuji, I just want to tell the audience if you have any question, please write it in the chat, and I will uh, I do I will share it with our speakers. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, it's fine now. Okay, so I talk about the uh, uh, invention of blue LED and uh, the application. So just my yeah, uh, let's you know bio. So basically, uh, I uh, worked for Nietzsche from 1799, and uh, I received the Nobel Prize in 2014. And now I'm I'm the professor of uh, Mater uh, and the Department of University of California, Santa Barbara, since 2000. So today I talk about uh, uh, how I, I could invent blue and green LED and also violet laser diode. And then I talk about applications. So that was um, my introduction. So this is shows uh, uh, Japan. Japan is composed of small uh, four islands. So basically I, I studied here, I was born here and I worked here and uh, I, I could invent blue, green and laser diode here in Shikoku Island, smallest island. So basically, you know, uh, I was uh, born here in a fishery village, small fishery village in Oku and, uh, and uh, high school and junior high school, I went to, uh, you know, Ozu City and uh, I enjoyed volleyball. And after graduation high school, I went to local uh, university, Tokushima University, here, located here. And uh, after getting the master's degree, you know, I, I graduate and I joined a small chemical company, Nichia, located here, Anan City. And uh, so basically, you know, uh, uh, yeah, here is the uh, Anan City, you know, uh, I, I joined a small chemical company. So I worked for a small chemical company for 20 years. So during those periods, uh, I could invent blue, green, and white LEDs, also blue laser diode. The amazing thing is the company founder, president, didn't like any collaboration. 
So without any collaboration, we could develop all of LED laser diodes ourselves. And uh, we never uh, got any government money, zero, because no collaboration. So this is my first day out in Nichia. I joined in Nichia 79, you know, uh, and these are uh, newcomers. So uh, I'm here, so, you know. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay. Yeah, he's a chairman and the president. You know? Yeah, Pierre Chemical Company. You know? uh, okay. And you are uh, the one on the right, right? Uh, I'm here, this one. Okay, <laughs> in the middle. He's the tallest one. Yeah, yeah. you know, pretty tall. <laughs> I've never seen these pictures. They're great. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, this, is, this guy graduated from Kyoto University, a high ranking university, and uh, these uh, girls graduated high school. So this is a high-ranking university and a low-ranking university and high school student. <laughs> <laughs> local, low-ranking university, you understand? <laughs> no? All the position is already determined by which university graduate. So that, that's a Japanese style. So, you know, so this shows the history, uh, historical LED. <laughs> so this shows the red LEDs. So red LED was, was you know, uh, invented in the 60s, and the efficiency of red is increased uh, like this. But in order to make uh, any kind of colors, uh, three primary colors is uh, required. So all over the world, many science, science try to develop high efficient blue and green LEDs. But uh, nobody could uh, develop. Uh, but uh, in, in 92, 93, you know, uh, at uh, Nichia, you know, at Japan, local university, a uh, small company, chemical company, announced the mass production of blue LED in '93. Suddenly, so so also we developed the green LEDs in '95 and the white LEDs in '96. So so basically, you know, uh, my, my uh, former company developed uh, everything uh, ourselves without any collaboration, without any government money. Yeah, in the, totally independently in uh, Tokushima city, Ana city. So I joined the Nichia, no? uh, so first five years, I had to develop these products. Initially, I worked with the bulk crystal gloss, garlic marcenite, uh, garlic facet bulk crystal gloss, and I made uh, these epitax uh, wafers for substrate for in, to develop the infrared LEDs and uh, red LEDs. These are products now, you know, and also next I worked to develop the infrared and the red LEDs. Just we did the epitaxial growth using liquid phase epitaxial growth. So I developed this product, but uh, sales was very poor uh, at that time. But after announcement, blue LEDs in '93, company name, name value skyrocketed. So I had these sales now very good too. So uh, this is my uh, company's uh, founder, our uh, chairman, and uh, you know I, I respect him a lot because he is a very nice uh, uh, venture capitalist. He always supported me uh, uh, after joining a company. Uh, so, but uh, he already passed away, you know. Oh really? Yeah. So after joining a company, I started initially back to the bulk crystal growth, epitaxial warehouse. Uh, so. But initially, back to growth, I use this one, horizontal bridge map method, uh, just uh, using, uh, for, for guiding mass and growth, yeah, we use arsenic here, and uh, guiding metal here, and uh, basically use this one. Basically, this uh, reactor is a homemade reactor because company has no money, so everything homemade. So, you know, so quartz, this is a quartz, so horizontal bridge map method, we had to use quartz, so, uh, every day I had the welding, you know, from the early morning to the late afternoon, you know, using homemade re reactors, you know. So this welding is tough, you know, <laughs> because uh, every month I experienced the explosion of the, these uh, reactors because, uh, you know, because sometimes they are the cracking of uh, bad welding. So after, you know, bulk crystal growth, next I tried the epitaxial growth using liquid phase epitaxial growth. You can see this is me, and this is my homemade liquid phase epitaxial growth reactors. So everything is homemade. Uh, you know, I designed everything and this control, everything designed myself. And uh, because the uh, company has uh, no, no money, so we had to develop, uh, uh, make all kinds of reactors ourselves. 
So what is a LED? Uh, so basically a LED, you know, a basically there's a substrate and on the substrate, uh, there are three layers. Uh, you know, first is any type layer and the next red one is a emitting layer or active layer. And finally is a P type layer. So basically on the substrate, we need three layers, you know, for, to make LEDs. Uh, so laser, laser also a similar structure. And after, you know, make it developing the three layers on substrate. So substrate, we use a sapphire substrate. We could develop the first blue LEDs in 92. And this uh, substrate, sapphire substrate, you know. So basically, you know, using a, a nitride base, in this case, we use a three night, uh, gallium nitride based material, you know. So active layer, emitting layer, we use this indium gallium nitride. By changing the composition of uh, indium gallium nitrate, now we can make uh, uh, almost red to uh, 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 violet LED colors as a uh, commercial base. And now uh, application. So after you know invention of blue and green and white LEDs, uh, these are application. You know LEDs use all kind of uh, lighting application, also displays. You know. And especially for lighting application, it's a huge impact. Uh, you can see that. So this is a conventional lighting. Uh, for example, uh, bulb lamp is uh, efficiency on the 16 lumen power. A uh, frozen lamp is 70 lumen power. Now uh, uh, LED is uh, in a 300 lumen part. So it's uh, like also 300. And uh, so, you know, Four times efficient in corpus fluorescent lamp and 10 times efficient, efficient than the conventional incandescent bulb lamp. So, by, so it means that by replacing all of conventional lighting, we can save a lot of energy. So this is a uh, US DOE, uh, or DOE, uh, you know, uh, uh, analyze how much energy is saved. So this is, uh, you know, uh, you can see why you multiple factors contribute to the decline. I agree that the rapid emergence of LEDs and other energy efficient lighting has played a particular important role. So basically, this is uh, how much uh, you know, uh, electricity use at home, household. And uh, already every year is increasing, increasing now, but uh, around 2010, almost saturated in the US from 20, uh, 2010, you know. Now is uh, electricity they gradually reduce, reduce gradually. So, so main contribution they say is the LED or other you know or other energy efficient lighting. So also, you know, so mainly LED contributed a lot so to reduce the energy consumption in the US. Also, interesting application is uh, uh, vertical farming. Uh, Good to say, you know, because uh, uh, right now, you know, shortage of food is a big problem. So, especially due to the global warming, you know, weather is uh, unpredictable. But now, inside of a tall building, we can do the injury of uh, vertical farming. In that case, you know, we can increase the growth rate at least two times because no nighttime inside of the house using LED lighting, you know. And the yield of the plant is much higher, almost ninety uh, percent. And the water usage is very small because the water is recycled only one percent compared with the outside. This is the future agriculture, especially you know, south there are a lot of you know desert area, desert are the best place for <laughs> this vertical farming. And uh, so right now, you know, uh, profitable uh, vertical farming is uh, only lettuce cu cultivation, lettuce. Uh, let us, you know, uh, they can make a profit, but as a, as a plant is still tough, but uh, let us is uh, very uh, good. Also, most profitable one is uh, this one, uh, <laughs> narcotic <laughs> cultivation, <laughs> because uh, in California, it's now narcotics is uh, legal. So many, you know, also price is very high. So for not <laughs> cultivation, you know, they, they can use high technology, like uh, vertical farming. Uh, but uh, my pri private business, I don't like this one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, California is now legal, so. Okay. Yeah. So uh, why, you know, why uh, uh, at a local company, you know, we could invent blue LEDs? Uh, next, I talk about why you could invent blue LEDs. 
So to develop a blue LEDs or laser diodes, there are two kinds of material are available uh, since the 70s, zinc selenide or gallium nitride. So this shows uh, you know, uh, just the cross-sectional TEM of the zinc selenide or gallium nitride. You can see gallium nitride, you can see a lot of dark line. This is a crystal defect, crystal defect. Zinc selenide, no crystal defect. So they are common sense in uh, 70s, 60s. All of scientists say, you know, common sense, no crystal, you know, no crystal defect is uh, better for to, to develop a blue uh, LED and the laser diode. That is common sense, and out of that is the physics. If people try to this one, always all scientists said, oh, you are crazy. You have to study the physics at the university again. Because <laughs> you know, it's, it's science, everyone said this one. This is a physics. Physics <laughs> thinks say that. Because yeah. no Christian idea. That's the reason, you know, everybody worked for thinks say that. Uh, but gallium nitride, only few group worked for uh, gallium nitride. You know. And uh, for example, in 89, I started the uh, blue LED research in 89. At the time, you know, you know, zinc cyanide, uh, active, almost uh, more than 99% of the research about the zinc cyanide, and uh, only less than 1% of the research about the gallium nitride. For example, in 1992, I attended the Japanese Society of Applied Physics Conference. That, that is the biggest conference in Japan in this field. Our number of audience is more than 5,000. So wow. at first, I went to, yeah, I went to Garmin Nitride Session. Garmin Nitride Session always used the smallest uh, room. And uh, only speaker was two speakers. Each speaker is 15 minutes talk. And uh, after 30 minutes, this session is over, no? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. next, I went to Zinc Sign Session. Zinc Sarah says the biggest, you know, uh, uh, audio room, you know, biggest room, like a gym, gyms, you know, huge, you know, number of audience more than 500. And I couldn't enter the, this Zinc Sarah session, you know, because too many people. <laughs> That's, you know, at that time, you know, you know, all of the people, scientists, the government had no future, government people had to move Zinc Sarah material. The reason is that uh, in uh, 91, you know, this is a uh, most famous paper of zinc cyanide. You know, American my 3M succeeded in making the first blue green laser lasers, laser diode using zinc cyanide. Zinc cyanide. So this is spread all over the world. This uh, paper cited many, many scientists. And this uh, at the time, you got all kinds of physics journal science magazine reported this result. And zinc cyanide is enough for blue LED laser, gallium LED laser. So, so, so it's in 93, you know, zinc cyanide is so popular. But in my case, you know, I went to University of Florida one year from 80 to 89, just before starting a blue LED research, just one year. I went there for, as a business researcher for one year because I wanted to go to foreign country, you know. And, uh, and uh, all of you know PhD students over there, they asked me, you know, uh, whether I have a PhD degree. I said no, I have only I had only master degree because uh, my local university took me the only master degree. And uh, so at the joining those period, I had to construct this uh, uh, <coughs> more CPD with the PhD student. And uh, one year later, I, I came back. You know, uh, no. So so at that time. It <coughs> PhD is asked the PhD, you know, so I understand that, that I can understand that PhD is very important in the United States as a scientist. So one year later, I came back to Japan. My dream was uh, became a getting a PhD degree. Uh, and at the time, you know, uh, in Japan, we could get a PhD degrees, just publishing more than five scientific papers. Uh, we didn't have to go to university to get a PhD degree at that time. The, it's called the paper degrees. So I wanted to publish a lot of papers. So there are two kinds of uh, material, zinc cyanide or gallium nitride. Zinc cyanide, uh, every year, maybe more than 100 papers. Uh, gallium nitride, only one or two papers every, you know, <laughs> at that time, a year. So that's the reason I selected gallium nitride, you know, because it, I thought it is easy to publish papers by selecting gallium nitride. 
you know, uh, so that's why I select the garden right away. But uh, I never thought I could invent brewery these at that time. Just publishing five that paper, I get after getting a PhD degree, I wanted to quit a company. So that is my goal. But uh, coincidentally, I could invent a brewery this. <laughs> so yeah. So in '89, uh, uh, I started brewery D after coming back to Japan from University of Florida. So the problem is, uh, you know. No, any type of garden light available, but the missing layer is uh, in gun emitting layer and the P-type gun layer. This is a missing layer. So I have to develop two layers, you know, in gun layer and the P-type garden light layer. So, so initial big problem is the MOCB reactor. So initially I purchased a commercial level of MOCBD, uh, but it didn't work. So, so, so I had to uh, modify the reactor, uh, you know, every day. And, uh, you know, every morning I modified the reactor. Every afternoon I did a, a, did a growth using modified reactors. I continued this pattern one and a half year. So, and the final, I could develop this uh, MOCBD. I named the two flow MOCBD. They are two flow. So, so this is my biggest breakthrough uh, technology because after this invention of two frame of CBD, I could uh, you know uh, I could um, uh, achieve the uh, uh, many breakthroughs using this one, uh, this uh, M two frame of CBD. For example, uh, P-type garum nitride, you know, I using two frame of CBD, uh, I could make a very good P-type garum nitride because uh, you know at that time you know. People are using uh, magnesium as uh, acceptors, you know, but uh, always the uh, resistance became uh, semi-insulating after growth. But uh, in my case, it's just using a summer annealing, you know, just I got a uh, low resistance P-type carbon nitride. Uh, also, I clarified the uh, mechanism, why people get the P-type carbon nitride. I, I proposed a hydrogen passivation for the first time. And this is, uh, you know, now common sense of the hydrogen passivation, you know, is the biggest problem of P-type layer. So next is the emitting layer, intim garam nitride. So emitting layer is also a key. Uh, this is another big breakthrough, but the physics people doesn't care about so much. <laughs> because uh, uh, at that time, several groups try to uh, intim garam nitride growth, but no, uh, room, uh, there are no emission at all at room temperature. So, but uh, using two flow MOCBD, I we could observe the fast, uh, you know, uh, blue and the violet emission uh, using PL and uh, yeah. So that's uh, another big breakthrough. So we could solve the two problem: indium garum nitride emitting layer, p type garum nitride in 1992, using two flow MOCBD, and we stuck to these uh, three layers on sapphire substrate. <laughs> and it demonstrates the uh, fast, high efficient blue LEDs in 93. You know, at that time, power is 2.5 milliwatts, but uh, this is a big breakthrough. And uh, Nobel Prize, I, you know, uh, I received Nobel Prize in 2010. Uh, <coughs> so they cited our first blue LED, uh, LEDs, you know. And the next is uh, we demonstrated our first uh, uh, bio laser diode in 96, 95, but the paper appeared in 96. This is the first demonstration of the uh, uh, bio laser diode. At that time, uh, always uh, we are competing with uh, Sony. Sony is uh, still using a uh, zinc serenade, you know. At that time, uh, every conference uh, in Sony and uh, 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 was uh, invited. Uh, Already we talked about the future and the beta or not, no, but we uh, could compete with the Sony, you know. And uh, I want to skip this one. This is a physics now. Now physics people now try to try to explain why the you know uh, defect material of garden light can make a high efficient blue LEDs, you know. So now physics people, you know, now understand you know defect material also could make a high efficient blue it's possible, you know. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, so now laser is also used for the uh, initially, you know, laser diode is expected to use, use for the Blu ray DVD, but the Blu ray DVD market is not so big. So now, you know, laser, uh, Blu ray diode also is for la uh, lighting, it's called laser lighting, uh, and especially for automobile headlamp and uh, 
also a projector. They like to use a high fish, high power blue laser and green and red. They like to use a phosphor. Uh, those phosphor are excited by blue laser lasers. Yeah, also blue laser is also laser welding on the 3D printers. I you know. The advantage is that currently uh, laser welding is they use infrared laser, but the infrared laser you know, is a absorption coefficient very small, uh, especially for this metal, nickel, copper, almost no absorption using a I, uh, infra compensation I, IR lasers. But the blue is, uh, you know, you can see that, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, absorption is much higher uh, in the blue region. So the, that's the reason they like to use for those uh, metal welding cutting, they like to blue lasers. I think that's all my talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice talk, Suji. Yeah. In chat. Abdullah, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. So yeah, thank you, Professor Shuji, for this interesting talk about the blue LED and how it transformed the lighting technology around the world from the old 20% efficiency uh, incandescent light to this uh, more plus 80% efficient blue LED. And that's a huge uh, uh, transformation for, uh, for the entire uh, world. Yeah, we appreciate the, your hard work uh, for in, uh, realizing this technology. Uh, now, I have a question, but uh, just to keep uh, on time, I, I have to transfer to Professor Stephen Dembars, who will uh, talk to us about the uh, use of LEDs and laser in advanced displays and communication. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Steve, the podium is yours. Thank you, uh, Abdullah, for inviting me to this talk. Let me Get my screen going here. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, I see yeah. it. Clearly. Okay, let's get my laser pointer out. Here we go. Okay, so I'll be talking furthermore on, uh, you know, Suji introduced you what was really a revolution in, in material science, at least in semiconductor material science. I think it was one of the, the second biggest revolution after silicon uh, in terms of its impact on, on the impending. And I'll show you now. Uh, not just what happened in the past, but what we see is advanced uh, future applications of this technology that we're working with CACs and the Kingdom on. Um, so I've been uh, a professor here at UCSB for 30 years. Before that, I actually made red LEDs at Hewlett Packard. So I've been involved in the, uh, the LED and lighting industry for over 32 years. Um, basically got my PhD in, in 88 and then went to work at Hewlett Packard and then uh, came here. Minimize that. Why is that not advancing? There we go. So the talk outline. So uh, I'll talk first about what I call the advanced uh, display and communication applications of uh, LEDs. We'll talk about developments of micro LEDs, uh, which is going on currently. Uh, you'll start to see products emerging. Um, there's already some TVs out with it, some large format TVs, but you'll start to see some of the what I call the uh, the augmented reality or virtual reality displays in the next uh, few years. Some of that work involved work with uh, CACS researchers in the development of tunnel junction LEDs to get red, green, and blue. And then recently we've even reduced the pixel size now down to one micron, which is gonna enable the highest resolution displays so that you can actually have uh, things like Google Glass and, and very close, um, even contact lenses with displays in them. And we'll show you some examples of that. Then I'll talk to you about some of the advanced applications of gallium uh, nitride lasers uh, in laser lighting, uh, the work we've done with, uh, with the kingdom uh, in laser communication. It's called uh, LIFI, which is short for light fidelity. And then finally, uh, I think a very bright future for lasers now, diode lasers that made with this semiconductor in chemistry and green energy. So what is a micro LED? So 
the LED light uh, that, that that are used in your light bulb uh, typically are about uh, about 0.1 millimeter square area. And so that means they're about 200 microns by 500 microns wide. So micro LEDs are generally considered to be uh, LEDs with dimensions below about 20 microns. <clears throat> this, is, this is the size of a micro LED here, and this is what's uh, the size of the conventional LED. So it's taken us almost uh, a decade now to reduce the size from these uh, several hundred microns to 20. And then like I mentioned to you, we're now even making one micron uh, LEDs uh, that are reliable, bright, and efficient. So why is this gonna be a big impact in display? Well, I'm just showing you uh, that this is the next big thing. Uh, and the reason is uh, that making the LED so small, you can now put displays onto uh, dimensions that now fit into your glasses. But there's also was a demonstration this year you can make a projector, that is something that will project light from your cell phone, and it's the size of a matchstick. So this is an example of a matchstick projector um, shown at Society for Information Displays. And uh, this is, even though you could just barely see the projector here, when they put a, a lens in front of it and they did a mock-up cell phone, it projected a display about eight and a half by 10. So you can project images rather on your tiny screen, you can actually project them onto the wall. The other thing that this lets you do is you can uh, make any form factor. This is an example that uh, just uh, was opened later, uh, earlier this year in Las Vegas. It's now the biggest LED um, display in the world. And it's actually, when you go inside here, it fits 10,000 people. It's now a concert venue. And the entire surface of this uh, sphere is coated with uh, both regular LEDs, but also micro LED screens so that it's a virtual environment for concerts and uh, for education movies. Nope. Interesting. Uh, so future, I think it's gonna, you're gonna start to see increasingly being used. Going to such a small LED, you can now make true flexible handheld uh, displays. Uh, this was just like I said, early examples of, of embedding the teeny little micro LEDs in, the, uh, in eyeglasses. And this is now transparent because you can put so much space between the micro LEDs that you don't even see the LED until it's turned on. I mentioned currently the, the only uh, large area commercial product out with micro LEDs is uh, something called the wall by Samsung. So you can actually team these uh, LEDs up to make the largest uh, TV displays in the world. Uh, and as opposed to the early you know, football stadium displays where you could actually see the pixel, the advantage of these displays is you cannot see any pixel. So it looks perfectly lifelike. So, you know, why is uh, why are LEDs going to revolutionize displays? The incumbent technologies right now are LCD and OLED, uh, with OLED taking a greater market share. But as we'll see, the micro LEDs really enable uh, a huge increase in three areas compared to OLED technologies. One of them is, is, is brightness. So that earlier display I showed you of the LED sphere in Las Vegas, you need a brightness to see that in sunlight of around 15,000 uh, candela per meter squared. So this is called a NIT. So micro LEDs have enormous brightness, no problem. Uh, th so that display, you can do 100,000 NITs. So this is easily viewable in the brightest sunlight in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you can <laughs> see these displays. So no problem. You can see it on your, your windshield screen. And so that's one of the things that people, the automotive people are trying to develop is that you can use this brightness to now see it in sunlight. OLEDs cannot be used for heads-up display. The, the big advantage, and, and similar to LED lighting, is the efficiency. A 90% lower power consumption relative to LCD. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why your, your, uh, your batteries on your cell phone and uh, watches, the display consumes over 70% of the power. So in other words, you, you can probably make watches in the future, in fact, people have said, where you don't need to charge your, uh, your iWatch, but every five days, rather than put it on the charger every day. So 90% lower power consumption. But the kind of more impressive factor is the micro LEDs are already uh, up to 100,000 hours of reliability. So like your LED light bulbs, these things are going to last 30 years or more. So huge advantages. So market demands. So what's driving this? 
is really the kind of the market <clears throat> transitioning. You used to look at big TV screens. Hopefully, I, I can imagine some of you people are watching this um, this uh, seminar we're giving today on smartphones. Uh, and in the future, we hope you'll use uh, virtual reality and maybe we can take you inside the LED in a three-dimensional talk next time. Um, <laughs> these require virtual reality and the so-called projection micro display. They require something called uh, a huge resolution, which is pixels per inch. So down here, you could see that as you go from a TV, uh, for instance, uh, an iPhone watches about uh, 480 pixels per inch, but virtual reality actually needs about 5,000 pixels per inch. So getting to 5,000 pixels per inch so that your, your glasses, your virtual reality glasses look lifelike is uh, one of the biggest problems facing your device. <laughs> So the nice thing is that micro LEDs uh, can now be driven to sizes below 10 microns, so we can meet all these size requirements. <clears throat> Other thing that going to small sizes lets you do is reduce the cost. So this is the cost estimates and our current goal. So for a smartphone now, uh, if you were making 10 micron uh, red, green, blue micro LEDs, the cost of the display in the smartphone would be about $65. And that's just too much for Apple to pay the display manufacturer. So we are now uh, down at one micron in the red, green, and blue. So we are now down below our 2023 goal. So I envision displays being made with micro LEDs that are going to be less than $10 uh, very soon. And so this is where the manufacturers, this is why a lot of the media companies like uh, not only Google, but Meta, and Apple are spending a lot of money, not, not just working with display manufacturers. They have their own in-house display teams because the display is how we communicate with the world. So next question. So we're kind of left with a question that Suji started with, which is what material should we use for red, green, and blue? Uh, currently, believe it or not, for the red, people are using aluminum gallium phosphide. And this was the material I worked with 32 years ago at Hewlett Packard. This is still the dominant material for red. And the reason you need red is you need all three colors, red, green, and blue, to make white or any color you want. I think it's obvious we're going to use green. It's going to be indium gallium nitride. And blue is going to be also indium gallium nitride. But what we now think we want to do is we want to achieve very high efficiency red in the indium gallium nitride. And if we can do that, then we don't need to marry these two material systems, but we can put it all together. And uh, this currently shows you uh, where we are in the efficiencies with the, uh, the uh, in what I'd call large scale uh, LEDs. But even in the red now, we've gotten to uh, 6% in the red. And we need to get that to about 15% to defeat this, uh, this other uh, gallium arsenide based material. So what was the big problem and, and what continues to be a big problem when you reduce the size of the LED from something that's really big to very small, as you can see here, this is what's called EQE or external quantum efficiency. This exactly measures how many photons of light you get in or get out for every electron you put in. So 25% means that for every electron, <coughs> it's only a 25% probability that a photon will come out. And so you can see as we go to smaller sizes, the efficiency drops pretty quick. So that was a big problem. Uh, but we, we were uh, the first research institute to solve that. And we employed a new technology of atomic layer deposition, which was primarily being used in the silicon industry and it was not being used in the LED industry. And uh, basically in 2018, seven years ago, we employed that to uh, passivate the sidewall here of the micro LED. Because as you reduce the size of the LED, the sidewall becomes very important to what's going on in the uh, active region. But I think it's just better to show you how important atomic layer deposition is on the impact of the device. So this is the first row here shows you the traditional LED fabrication process. So as people went from 100 by 100 to 20 microns, you could see the brightness went down a lot. So people said, well, I don't think it's going to be possible to make a display with a resolution of below 10 by 10 microns. And they, they tried uh, what's called plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition to put down SiO2 to pass it. And that actually made things worse. And this was kind of weird because it works, this works great at 200 by 200, but it starts dropping off pretty quick. 
and we found out that this was actually damaging the the sidewalls of the LED, which isn't a problem when the LED is big, like for your your LED light bulb. But it's a problem when you're trying to make a very small LED. Uh, so we were pretty surprised, uh, even ourselves, that the ALD, even a 10 by 10 micron, really was still quite bright. And so uh, we knew that this was going to be a key technology to to develop uh, for other LEDs. So that's why ALD is now being used by almost every manufacturer that's working on this process. The other technology we wanted to develop is what's called a tunnel junction for the top contact. And what a tunnel junction is, is it, it is tunneling uh, basically an electron out of P-type material uh, to get an electron. And what that'll let you do is replace the top P-type. Uh, on top of P-type, we usually put what's called indium tin oxide or ITO. And ITO, it only has about 80% transmission. Tunnel junctions, being uh, a wider band gap than blue, have 99% transmission. So this will actually help the efficiency of our micro LEDs. And it also does something even better. Uh, the initial uh, thing was to do, if we can do all three uh, colors with the same material system, then rather than get three different LEDs and put them together on a substrate, you can what's called epitaxially grow. That is, we deposit this in one reactor step. You actually uh, can grow blue, green, and red all on the same wafer. And believe it or not, you can do this whole structure, uh, deposit it in only four hours. Uh, versus having to get three different wafers and three different epi runs and cut them apart and put them together. So this is our uh, vision for a, what's called a monolithically integrated red, green, blue micro display. Uh, but the problem was when we tried to stack the LEDs on top of each other, the hydrogen needs to come out from the p-type. So one of the things Suji mentioned that got him the Nobel Prize was the fact that he figured out that hydrogen was passivating this magnesium atom here, and you had to thermally activate it in an environment without hydrogen around. And if you did that uh, at temperatures above 600 degrees Celsius, you could see the resistivity dropped six orders of magnitude. So that's a million fold change in resistance. So this is highly resistive, but this is low resistivity. And this got him the Nobel Prize. But when we tried to do this in micro LEDs, we found out that. This uh, p-type gallium nitride, the hydrogen was being blocked by the n-type, and so uh, one of our uh, researchers at the time uh, in joint research with CAX was Dr. Abdullah Hassan. He said, uh, "Well, let's just let's just put a little hole here and let the hydrogen come out in our uh, micro LEDs, and that will let the hydrogen diffuse out." And so, indeed, uh, this is what the top n-type gallium nitride tunnel junction looks like. That solved. The how to make a tunnel junction uh, work in the LED space. And so um, today, uh, then we now employ that even in our micro LED research, because if we look here on that quantum efficiency measurement, and this one is now even wall plug efficiency, which takes into account the voltage, you can see that we're getting 55% of all input power is converted to light. And this is very important because almost all production is currently being done here with ITO which is down here with the black line. But what's even more striking is that micro LEDs are gonna run at a current density of around one to five amp per square centimeter. So that means the range of micro LED, and let me switch to a pen here because I wanna emphasize this. The range of micro LED current that we need is right here. So it's not just two times better, we're getting three to four times better improvement in the efficiency by switching to these uh, to this new technology. So you can see how impactful semiconductor technology can be because if you have a, a micro LED screen and it's only 20% energy efficient, threefold increase will mean your Google glasses will last three times longer, which was the biggest problem, by the way, with displaying glasses is you have very, you have very little room to put a battery in these glasses. But if you have a very efficient display, we can now fit the battery in the frame and uh, you don't have to take off your glasses every hour and charge them. Uh, very nice. Uh, Steve, what is cycles? Oh, so, so so cycles is how many times we heat it up and take it through this uh, thermal cycle to drive out the hydrogen. So what you have to do is, because there's some space here that's still covered with n-type, you have to give the hydrogen time to diffuse up and out this hole. 
And so Matt Wong found out, yeah, zero cycles is good. Got you to this red line, but taking it up to three cycles, you, you can see we went from 35% to 55%. Okay, then the last kind of, I think, problem for uh, augmented reality is now scaling it down to one micron. And there's still there's still a lot of work to do here. We'll see the efficiency. But what's impressive is that we we have been able to scale it down. And this was one of my uh, graduate students, Georgia Smith, did that in both the blue and the green, and then recently the red. And this is the, this is the width of a human hair here, by the way. Uh, and we're able then, you can see here, we're able to fit in 42 micro LEDs on a human hair. And what's even more impressive is this is one one LED, one micro, one one micron micro LED lit up in room light. And you can easily see this teeny little LED lit up in room light. And so that's that's impressive. Um, I said we extended it to the red. So this shows you how we extended it to the red. You can also see this is a 20, this is a 40 by 40 micro LED. We put in a little holes here developed by Dr. Abdullah Hassan to get the activation up. So that is now, let's just put this N-type gallium nitride directly on the P-type. And this gives you a nice bright red light. So this is true red uh, micro LED at 624 nanometers. A little broad, but it's still good enough because they can just put a filter on it to make it a little as narrow as you want. And uh, it's like I said, it's now 6% efficient. Uh, and it's 6% efficient right around that 5 to 10 amp per square centimeter range. So this is the best reported red micro LED now in the literature for the even last uh, year and a half running. So now you have all three colors in micro LEDs. You have the red, the green, and the blue. Uh, we just did a simple demonstration here. Um, took all three chips out and put them on a piece of plastic. And we probed it just to show you. You can integrate them now very easily onto a flexible surface and get all three colors out. So in the last part of my talk, and I've got uh, a little bit of time here before it much goes, I'll talk about laser diode research uh, in, in kind of highlight what we see as a, a huge future opportunities there as well. So just for the audience, uh, you know, just to bring everybody up to speed, what what's the real difference when you're talking about semiconductor in a laser versus an LED? And there's two big advantages, uh, basically arising from the fact that LED light uh, comes from spontaneous emission. So uh, in an LED, actually, this is this figure is not even exactly correct. Uh, the spontaneous emission emits light in all directions. So light is actually coming out of your LED not in one direction. It's actually coming out all directions. It's even coming down the bottom, uh, but we usually put a mirror back here, but in our transparent filament LEDs, it comes out all directions. So an LED spontaneous light has no directionality to it. In a laser uh, diode, the light basically comes out in a single direction because instead of spontaneous, it's stimulated emission. That is the photon will stimulate another electron to fall down and create uh, a, a stimulated photon so that this process will then be amplified. They'll all come out in the same direction and they'll all come out at the same energy level. So this all gives us directionality here to the laser. So the laser, the light will come out generally, uh, it actually comes out both the front and the back facet. But if you put a mirror on the back facet as well, it only comes out the front facet. Same with a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. This is also a laser here, but it's a vertical geometry laser that we also make. And there you put a high reflectivity mirror on the backside, so the light comes out the top. So that gives you directionality. But the other thing is you all only really get light out of this same energy level here. And that's a very narrow spectrum of light. And that single discrete wavelength we'll see is also going to be very useful in making the applications and devices. So what are these uh, devices that you can make now with the laser diodes? So believe it or not, uh, I, I'm sure there's a couple laser cinemas in Riyadh. Uh, if not, I'd be surprised. But you don't know this, but behind the projector is a laser light uh, screen. So Barco, some of the largest cinema projectors are now being made with lasers. 
That's only been in the last four years that you can start to see laser cinema. If you see the Dolby Atmos system, uh, then you're probably watching laser cinema and you didn't even know it. Hmm. But believe it or not, future autonomous driving is going to use LiDAR in the car headlights, uh, which are going to be uh, help with collision avoidance. You're going to see uh, basically light bulbs with high data rate communication. And this is the Li-Fi uh, light fidelity networks I talked about that we've been developing with CAXT and CAUS for the last 10 years. And even uh, we can see lasers now in some of the glasses. So, so why is that going to be used for things like car headlights or laser cinema? It's because of that spontaneous emission um, disadvantage where light's going in all directions, uh, which is good for a typical light bulb. But if you want what's called a directional light bulb, that is something that's putting out light in a, in a kind of defined direction like you would need for a cinema or a car headlight, you only need a single LA laser chip here. So this is a single 0.3 millimeter laser chip compared to 11 millimeters of uh, LED material. So this is about, could be considered to be, uh, uh, it's actually 33 LEDs. <laughs> and this is one laser diode chip. So you can make a laser di a, a light bulb with a single laser diode and get a very good EQE, especially at, at the very high current densities. We're now running these at 4,000 amperes per centimeter. And this shows you a, a, a light bulb made with it. So in this case, if you put the teeny little blue LED laser light here, and in this case, we expanded it to be a, a square here, you can see we can still get a lot of light out. A thousand lumens is easily what you need for a 40 watt light bulb. So basically a single uh, single laser diode chip can enable uh, an efficiency of what's called 87 lumens per watt. And that is actually six times better than an incandescent bulb. Of course, Suji's uh, white LEDs today are around 200 lumens per watt. So they're still, the LED is still more efficient from a lighting point of view, but for what's called directional applications, uh, like wall mounted uh, projection displays. Here's a laser TV from uh, this is a Lucky Gold Star. You can just put the display right up against the wall. It's very directional and it easily projects a very nice 140 inch uh, laser TV. And you can put just three lasers in the car headlight. You put the phosphor in front of it. So there's actually not a laser beam coming out, but it's very directional. And uh, as Suji mentioned, that directionality here really buys you some distance. And believe it or not, that gives you increased uh, light visibility, safety at night, a lot less glare. So each one of these signposts here is 100 meters. So that's 100 meters for an LED uh, high beam. So most electric vehicles today are using LED high beam. But uh, a couple of the top uh, manufacturers, such as BMW and Audi, uh, shown here, there's Audi, here's BMW, have developed it. And you can buy uh, BMW headlights. I'm not sure if you can buy them in the kingdom yet, but you can in the, in Europe. And you can see, you can count the signposts here. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six. You can actually see something in the road here at 700 meters. So huge increase in uh, range. You can even buy flashlights, which have this kind of range for viewability at night. So huge increase in safety. Okay, last uh, few applications before I turn it over to Umesh. Uh, one thing we've been working on for the last 10 years with uh, CAX and KAUST has been using the uh, the light source to communicate. Uh, you know, once you get inside the house, usually you start to lose signal. We can take the signal from the wireless network and then transmit it into the light bulbs and then directly communicate with your phone or device with, uh, with light down to the device. And that's what we mean by um, by light uh, communication. Also in the ocean, believe it or not, uh, the color blue green, even though it shows green here, it's actually blue green. You can go up to uh, greater than a kilometer because seawater is actually, believe it or not, very transparent to the blue green color. That's why it is blue green and absorbs the red and infrared. And uh, we can do underwater communication. Underwater communication is a big problem as you, as you may know, because radio waves and the uh, infrared wavelengths don't transmit. So that's why people use sound or sonar. However, uh, light communication in the blue-green spectrum can now be used for distances on the order of a kilometer at very high data rates. Um, 
So again, that simulated emission is going to buy us a lot of advantage here because if we look at the what's called the frequency response, basically how fast you can turn the device on and off, you can see a laser diode, even with a phosphor in front of it, is much faster than the LED bandwidth. So we basically go from 0.1 gigahertz or uh, even slower to now speeds above one gigahertz. And uh, we've been able to even get, uh, even with the red green phosphor in front of the laser diode chip, we've been able to get higher than one gigahertz uh, limit. So this initial measurements we did with cats and cows, we were limited to about one gigahertz. Uh, this is what the system looks like. You have a, it's called a, a detector here, avalanche photo detector. Here's our laser chip and you transmit your uh, digital information over free space. Uh, and as I mentioned, or as uh, Abdullah mentioned, uh, we were at around one to two gigahertz. Uh, we're now uh, up around 6.8 uh, uh, gigahertz. And so that modulation bandwidth is now uh, greatly better than some of the record LED performance, which is down uh, just a little above uh, one. Uh, one uh, gigahertz for what's actually not a typical LED, but it's a, a micro cavity resonant LED. So I can I think you'll see this bandwidth limit continue to go up because uh, similar to fiber optics, it's the same principle. So we should be able to get that thing up to 100 gigabit per second uh, in the future. Uh, and as you know, 100 gigabit per second, you can transmit a lot of information. Okay, some of the future and kind of th I think exciting areas where we're trying to work with the, the kingdom on is now looking at light-driven chemistry. And here, uh, the idea is that you could take chemicals in the petrochemical industry and use, rather than heat, which is the normal way you do refinement or change chemicals, you can use inexpensive photons to exactly target the energies you want to drive uh, chemical reactions. And one of the ones we're looking at is a new project with our chemical engineering, uh, Professor Phil Christopher, is to take uh, ammonia, which is a liquid gas, and uh, basically uh, on-site production of a very um, uh, cost-effective way is to generate hydrogen. As you know, we could generate uh, nitrogen, which is going to be inert, but we can generate from, from basically liquid ammonia on-site hydrogen, which can then be used in a fuel cell or other applications. So this is now uh, being driven directly, and fortuitously, it turns out the wavelength you need here is blue. So uh, that's why we're developing to look at the blue lasers and even uh, possibly UV uh, will be even better efficiency at driving these chemical reactions. Other uh, applications for the UVA uh, lasers, we do biosensing. Uh, that is, you can directly detect uh, dangerous chemicals in the air or in liquids by using that. And uh, the other one, the really big one I could say, uh, is doing laser inertial fusion. As you know, the National Ignition Facility used uh, basically 350 nanometer uh, wavelengths uh, to demonstrate the fusion of hydrogen and deuterium into helium uh, to generate energy in a positive thing. Now, what they didn't tell you is that even though they got net positive energy gain, the overall system energy was not uh, an energy gain because they used frequency tripled lasers, big lasers that use a different technology. Whereas if we can switch that to laser diodes, we can get these 50, 60% efficient laser sources, then that will make the net system efficiency of laser fusion much more uh, achievable in the future. And finally, uh, in our work in UV LED research with, with CACs, developing UV LEDs in a 280 nanometer range uh, down here, we can make, uh, LED sources that basically, in this case, we could sterilize COVID off a, a surface in only uh, 30 seconds. So lots of uses for these technologies. Uh, the last one I'll show before concluding is it turns out that you need uh, these visible wavelengths. So gallium nitride can actually span all the wavelengths needed for quantum computing from 380. And currently, uh, a simulated emission has been demonstrated uh, by our group all the way into the yellow here at 590. Uh, and then as Ab Abdullah mentioned, uh, we got even down now around uh, 368. Uh, so we can span a lot of the very important wavelengths needed for trapped ion quantum computing. So in summary, uh, I hope I kind of uh, 
educated you to the uh, advantages of micro LED technology, why we believe, uh, along with several other large companies, that this is the next generation of high brightness, ultra efficient, and high resolution displays. Um, we demonstrate very high efficiencies in the blue, green. The red is currently at 6%. We'd like to improve that, but believe it or not, if you combine the, just these three numbers, you can see we're already uh, going to be able to make a display that's around 25% efficient with micro LEDs, which is much better than what LCD is, which is currently 3%, uh, and even OLED's around 10%. So we're already well away on our efficiency goal. And finally, uh, I think blue lasers um, and blue GAN lasers in particular have uh, achieved many new uses in laser display, energy and communication, and as Suji even mentioned, even laser welding. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, very exciting talk, covered uh, so many uh, exciting uh, topics from micro LEDs to displays to laser uh, lighting. And also, um, I was, um, uh, enjoy to see how many applications UV laser can enable, whether it's uh, ammonia cracking or uh, or the atomic clocks uh, and the, the laser fusion. So many applications for UV laser out there. Thank you. Uh, okay, now uh, just we'll leave the question for the for the end. Now uh, we, I'll move to Professor uh, Umesh Mishra. Uh, to, to today we talked a lot about gallium gallium nitride use in photonics, but uh, it is also as efficient in electronics. If uh, if you are happy, for example, with your fast charger that is powered by gallium nitride, but it's also used in five G uh, uh, communication and five G plus. We'll hear more uh, from uh, Professor Omish on uh, the technologies that is empowered and enabled by gallium nitride technology. So, uh, Professor Omish, the, the podium is yours. Hey, thank you very much, it's, uh, it's been uh, It's been fun listening to Shuji and Steve as well. So, uh, it's always good to have these symposia uh, organized by you so I can actually find out what my neighbors are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I'm Omesh Mishra and... Uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering uh, here at UC Santa Barbara, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to um, to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Sure. So, uh, hey, you missed, the, can, there you is a, to, can you go to slideshow? Because right now we see two V-graphs. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, it's over at top, top left. Uh, one one second. Yeah, there we yeah. go. Good. There you go. All right. Thanks. So, okay. Sorry about that. So, um, we basically have. Um, uh, where am I now? Hang on one second. Yeah. So basically, the biggest problem that one has in in uh, these uh, what we you know that's the whole reason we're we're part of this uh, the the effort that's going on at UCSP is energy usage uh, is a big problem. And the world continues to need more and more energy. But if you want to plot a positive correlation, what you see is that the most power that is consumed is always associated with more wealth. So the higher the uh, GDP per capita of a country, the more people actually consume. And so it's important that to recognize that wealth is always uh, related to energy consumption. So, of course, we want people to get wealthy all over the world. So the only way you're going to actually achieve this is basically and not need so much energy to, to be created and do go to, say, a lot of nuclear or some other forms of energy to just serve the needs of mankind. You have to have efficiency. And it's the only way where people can get wealthy and the world can still resource the energy that they need. Here's an example of how this actually works. You, what you see out here is on the right is 25 cubic feet. This is uh, about the volume of a refrigerator, say in the United States. In 1972, the energy consumption in kilowatts per year 
was about a little over 1700 kilowatts per year, kilowatt hours per year. This is for a 20 cubic foot refrigerator. And then what ended up happening is that as you introduce standards and things became more efficient, both in the inverter that drive the compressor and also in the compressor itself, you can see that the volume of the refrigerator remains the same. That means the functionality remains the same, but at the same time, the energy consumption has dropped by a factor of three. So efficiency is the way to actually solve a lot of the world's problem, not just creating more energy, using less, but at the same time, not make the people suffer, right? So it's not like give up something to save energy, um, gen use appliances that are more efficient. So where can we make a difference? In many, many, many areas. One area is, for example, lighting, and that you have heard of from Shuji and Steve. Efficient air conditioning and buildings is huge. Computing is a very, very big area. AIML is going to be one of the largest consumers of electricity in the future. And uh, we have to address uh, AIML. Communications, both photonics and RF. And then you have, of course, the renewable energy, electrification of transport, manufacturing. Everywhere we can make a difference. And this, the ma manufacturing being Industry 4.0, which is basically what's the new industry? And the new industry is all going to be driven by robots. So then gallium nitride actually is the preferred semiconductor alongside silicon. Why? Because the semiconductor has to be high performance based on application. It has to be very reliable. And by the way, uh, what Shuchi talked about was the z zinc selenide on gallium, gallium arsenide. It was very blue. Uh, the laser was great, but it didn't last very long. That's why it did not actually work. So performance is one thing. Reliability is far more important. Then you should cost is extremely important. Nobody will ever buy things at a high price unless it's a niche application. And semiconductors are not built for the rich. Semiconductor, the whole semiconductor industry is built for the common man. And that's the basic idea. So we must have high, uh, uh, high performance at low cost. And to get low cost, you need very wide market penetration. So you cannot be a niche technology. And gallium nitride is amazing because it has multiple applications. Photonics, which Shuji and Steve talked about. Electronics, which I'll speak to. And of course, sensing applications, both in the UV and chemical sensors. So there's going to be an extreme electronics. This is electronics at high temperature. And I don't have time to talk about everything, but please recognize that the applications of gallium nitride is vast. And that's why the nitride semiconductor technology is going to be the dominant technology. And in my, in my talk today, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial and say that it's going to actually replace silicon carbide in the future. Mm -hmm. So broad-based applications for GAN. We, you know, we talked about solid state lighting, airborne radar. This is basically from Saab. This is radar on aircraft, both commercial and uh, military. Data server power supplies. Data servers are now basically effectively going to, is, is just booming. Why? Because of cloud computing. All right. Everything is being, there's very little, there's edge computing and cloud computing. Edge computing is when you compute right where you sense the information. And cloud is, if you have a little time to make a decision, you just shift the data to the cloud and let it be uh, computed in the cloud. Compact uh, charges, I've never mentioned this. 5G base stations, every new 5G base station is powered by GAN. Every new 5G base station is powered by GAN, not silicon LDMOS. Silicon LDMOS is stuck at 4G. Home phase energy system, this is basically, and this is an example from end phase. Tesla has the same thing, where basically you have a battery that from the solar power, you charge up a battery for your home and you basically have uninterrupted power supply. And then the automotive application, which I'll come to later, it's vast. Gallium nitride comes in two forms in electronics, gallium polar, 
where the surface is gallium atoms, and the second is nitrogen polar, where the surface is nitrogen atoms. In photonics, you also have semipolar, which is not used in electronics. But we have pioneered at UCSB the science of technologies of both these forms. Gallium nitride is not grown, is not available in Mother Nature. You can't go out and mine gallium nitride. You can mine silicon carbide. Nature makes silicon carbide. But nature, nature has not made gallium nitride. This is truly a man-made material. So how do we grow it? It's very difficult to grow gallium nitride on gallium nitride substrate. I'm sorry. It's easy to grow gallium nitride on gallium nitride substrates. But gallium nitride substrates itself is very expensive at the present time. So we normally grow it on sapphire. How does it grow? It grows much like a dew on a leaf. So what we for particular we what we do is we first put a little bit of gallium on sapphire, gallium nitride on sapphire, and just like you have dew on the leaf, you end up with oh gosh, sorry. Let me just go to a laser pointer here. So just like you have dew on the leaf, you have small grains of you can imagine this to be gallium nitride, and you can have large grains, and you can see these two grains are next to each other. And when these two grains come close to each other, they become one grain. And that grain becomes a larger grain and a larger grain, just like this. So typically what happens is on a leaf, you'll get a bunch of dew. And then if there's enough dew, you'll get a film of water. This is exactly what happens in gallium nitride. You just put a few grains, they, be, they merge together, and then you get a film of gallium nitride. This is the magic that Tucci actually developed in 1990, okay? And this is what we use. It's just like copying mother nature, okay? So why is gallium nitride so remarkable? You basically have a material which has full of defects. If you look at something like this, you'll say you should never use it. However, it's amazing. It is, it's this, you know, it's a multi, it's more than $10 billion industry today. And from aluminum nitride to indium nitride, it covers a whole spectrum of light. And it's also a wide band gap solution that displaced silicon carbide in the past. Okay. Silicon carbide MESFETs were the future, supposedly. Silicon carbide MESFETs was the zinc selenide of, the, of electronics. Mes, silicon carbide MESFETs, for RF. Everybody said you should do silicon carbide MESFETs. Once Shuji made gallium nitride hems and Asif Khan made the, uh, sorry, Shuji made gallium nitride and Asif Khan made an algan gan hem. We basically ended up at UCSB taking this to the, to, the, to the market by developing a huge microwave technology, which now has displaced everything else. Nothing in life can be supported by the government forever. The market has to support it. The government can help in the beginning as it should. And I'm very proud of what the kingdom has been doing. Uh, to help uh, start all this. But in the future, the market has to support it. And here you see the 10-year ten ten year cumulative growth opportunity. Here's Frost and Sullivan is the source of this. You can see that you have 10-year cumulative growth opportunity of over $152 billion in electronics, okay? Wideband gap semiconductors, 35.2% of this $152 billion opportunity. It's huge. And why is it so big? Because there's in three different markets, all separate and all growing very fast. What, these are mega trends. One is the handset, uh, uh, which is the, the phone and the laptop and all these other mobile devices all need chargers. Okay. So smartphones, tablets, laptops, gaming consoles, all this require gallium nitride um, and data servers. Electric vehicles, gallium nitride has not entered it yet. It's on the threshold of entering it. And then it will basically enjoy a big market here. And then, of course, the RF we talked about. So the basic idea is that we waste a lot of energy. Converting electricity from the way you get it on the outlet, so 230 volts or 110 volts AC, convert it to DC for many appliances, that conversion is costs a lot of money because it's a wasted amount of energy. And here you get $40 billion of economic cost every year, which is 318 power coal 
power plant equivalents of power just wasted converting energy from one form to another. So efficiency is the way you, do, you basically prevent the need for generating energy. But to make, to convert energy in, an, in a functional way is always lossy. Typically what you have is if you want to turn your, your light on and off, you use a switch. That's very efficient because when it's on, it consumes no power. When it's off, it consumes no power. But when you want to have a dimmer, you want to actually make the light dim, then you have to use something which is uses what's called pulse width modulation. And this is, this is an, this causes the switch to turn on and off and on and off with at high frequency. This is lossy. And therefore dimmers, sometimes when you touch a dimmer, you'll find that it's warm. And that's because it's a lossy power conversion. You want actually a, de a device which is like an insulator when it's off and it's a conductor when it's on. You want an ideal switch. If you look at it, the, when the on resi the resistance has to be low, which means it has to be on the bottom of this Y axis and the amount of voltage the same device has to hold has to be high. So the star, the bottom right is where you want to be. And you can see silicon is here far from the bottom, gallium arsenide and silicon carbide and gallium nitride is right here. Okay. Of course, people are working on gallium oxide and diamond, but I believe that gallium nitride has such a large footprint that it will provide a lot of the solutions at very low cost. The fundamental difference, uh, benefit of gallium nitride is the same thing that gives it the blue light and the UV is the wide band gap, 3.4 electron volts. And this is the amazing thing. It's the only wide band gap material that has very high mobility. There is no other wide band gap material in the world that has high mobility. Gallium uh, oxide is 200, aluminum nitride is 200. This is 2000. Okay. Uh, and so uh, silicon carbide comes close. Silicon carbide has a mobility of about 800, okay, which is pretty damn good. And this is why silicon carbide is in the market. It's in the market because it has high band gap and high and reasonably high mobility. Gallium nitride has much higher mobility. There is a Moore's law, just like there's a Moore's law for ICs, there's a Moore's, what we call a Moore's law of power electronics. We just coined this phrase. In this particular, you have, and what you need is more power con conversion. That means you can convert more power from AC to DC, DC to AC in a smaller place. That means you need a high power density. That's the metric. More power conversion in a smaller volume. And you can see that this has been happening continuously. But the way we do this is not by making the lithography smaller and smaller and smaller that you do in, in, uh, ICs, you actually keep inventing new devices, bipolar transistors, IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistors, super junctions, and silicon. And then our silicon is now flat. Silicon can't improve anymore. Even the silicon guys accept that. But now what you have is silicon carbide, and then we believe after that can. So what is the basic device that we use? We use an algan gan hemp. An algan gan hemp is gallium nitride grown on some foreign materials, aluminum oxide, silicon or silicon carbide. And then you have algan on top of gan. At this interface, you have a two-dimensional electron gas. This is a very thin sheet of electrons that carries current. This is much like a MOSFET. So here, a MOSFET is a traditional silicon device. Here you can see the oxide here is replaced by algan here. The channel of in silicon is replaced by a channel in gallium nitride. What's the big difference? The big difference is the mobility of electrons in silicon, silicon dioxide. This mobility is 50, 5, 0. The mobility at the algan gan in interface is 2000. That is a huge difference. So here you have something that looks like a MOSFET, but it is on steroids. Okay. Now, huge amount of energy you can save. 
motors and high vac 28 terawatt hours renewable energy 65 terawatt hours ict ict is basically information technologies and uh, is and, and uh, various power conversion units 157 e mobility 81 terawatt hours in and that's in a country like india uh, the us you look like a developing country like india but you see that in India, you can see renewable energy and UPS is one of the biggest markets because the grid is not stable in India. So renewable energy and UPS is a huge market and you save 280 terawatt hours, different from a developed country with a very stable grid, okay? E-mobility is huge in India. Why? Because not because of cars, but because of scooters and three wheelers. All of India is going to switch to electric two and three wheelers. That's a huge savings and a huge market for GAN. Okay. And you get CO2 re reductions, emission reductions, as you can see here. And you can see again, developed countries and developing countries are different. Developed countries spend a lot more on data servers and you save a lot of money on ICT and PCs, less so in a country like India. But E-mobility in India is a huge saving relative to the U.S. And motors and HVACs in India is a much higher saving than the U.S. Because the U.S. already has pretty efficient uh, air conditioners using silicon. So the reason to switch from silicon to GAN, there is a, high, there's a barrier to entry. But in, in India, since there's very little penetration, they can go directly to GAN and bypass silicon. Big market, huge number of applications, all the way from 650 volts to 1,200 volts and beyond. And in 1,200 volts, gallium and silicon carbide are having a fight. But gallium nitride can cover everything from 30 volts to 1,200 volts. Silicon goes all the way to 1,500 volts. And sil silicon carbide is from 650 to 1,500 volts. So most of the market can be served by GAN. So why do you want to make, how do you get something into the market as opposed to the blue LED? The beauty about the blue LED is there was no blue LED. And so if you had a blue LED, people were willing to pay money for it. In the early days, uh, the blue LED used to be, cost $1, $2 for one LED. Okay, But you try to sell that against silicon, you'll never make a... So what do you have to do? You have to make the system very efficient. So big stuff costs more. So you have to make things smaller. That's the key. If you make things smaller, everything becomes less expensive. That's the key to electronics. Make things smaller, okay? Because transistors are small but very expensive. Passive elements like capacitors and inductors are huge. And they're very expensive because they have metals, they have uh, magnetic materials, copper, all this is very expensive compared to a little silicon, a uh, little gallium nitride chip. And also heat sinks are hugely expensive. It's big chunks of aluminum, very expensive. So if you make everything smaller, everything gets cheaper. Look at this. This is a, this is a satellite dish at four to eight gigahertz. This is called C-band. This used to be the way people used to communicate with satellites. But like I said, it was too big for normal homes. Okay, a normal home cannot accommodate this. And it's too ugly for an expensive home. So neither people, neither rich people nor the poor people could actually handle this. But when you went to a small dish like this, which is going to 12 to 18 gigahertz, this is what I worked with when I was at uh, Hughes Research Labs. This, is, this was one of the things I was working on using gallium arsenide and gallium indium arsenide low noise amplifiers. You could actually shrink the whole thing down. Because the dimension of the dish is inversely proportional to frequency. Higher the frequency, smaller the dish. So now you see this everywhere because it's cheap. You can put it on a window. And now satellite communications are everywhere. Look at the cost of a system. Mechanical, 33% of, of like a, a 
any kind of an inverter system, a PV inverter is what I'm talking about here. A solar inverter, 33% is mechanical, just the box. 27% are, are capacitors and inductors. Electromagnetic are the switches, right? Blah, blah, blah. Look at this. Semiconductor is 3.5%. Integrated circuit is 5.7%. The module is 7%. So what happens is you don't have to make the semiconductor go price go to zero. But if you make the semiconductor such that all this other stuff becomes much cheaper, you win big time. This is the amplification that you get from going to a technology like GAM. And here you see this. This is a, I won't go through this, but here's a technology which is in the market. You can buy this from Amazon. Corsair is a gaming power supply company which has GAN inside. Here, what they did was they basically, they had a 15, 1.5 kilowatt power converter using silicon. They actually could make the, in the same box, they could put 1.6 kilowatts. And they could put in more power and did not change the price. This has silicon, this has GAN. More, more power at the same price or less. Okay, so this is how you get into the market. Many applications of adapters, right? This is where it has really taken off. Here's an example of a UPS system. This is a very big deal, by the way. UPS is a big market. And what you see out here is, a by a, this is a very famous manufacturer of UPS systems. They have two boxes. These are called one U units, one unit. So you had two units to give you three KVA using silicon. They switched to GAN and they could provide the same wattage with one KVA. So now when you have a, a certain amount of rack space available, you can take out two units, put in one, get the same power, i.e. you can get double the power served from the same real estate. That's amazingly important. Okay. The electric vehicle is a big area, okay? And it's and the reason electric vehicles have become good is because batteries have become better, motors have become better, power electronics has become better, and software has become better. The first car in the world was electric. It was not made out of gasoline. The first car was electric. Okay, then we went to gasoline because it was more convenient and everything else and could give you long range and blah, blah, blah. Now we're back to electric, right? So look at the, this is a, where can gallium nitride play? Everywhere. It can play on the onboard charger. You need a charger to charge the battery. You need from the battery, which is 270 volts, up to 800 volt batteries now. You need to take that DC voltage and make it, step it down to all the DC voltages required in the car. Like you need 14 volts for the display. You need, you know, uh, 100 volts here, 50 volts there. So from an 800 volt bus, you have to step down to various voltages in the car. That's where GAN will play, onboard charger. Then in every car in the future, you will have a DC to AC inverter. What is this? This is basically a DC from the battery. It will it will actually convert it to AC. For what? Not to drive the motor, but to give you power in the case of an emergency. So suppose there's an earthquake. Suppose there's a flood. Suppose there's something. Then your car becomes your local power supply to keep your refrigerator running, to keep your, uh, if you are, if you're sick and you need a motor to give you oxygen, you can use your car to be the local power supply. So everybody, once electric cars become proper, become uh, common, electric cars will be a distributed power supply for the rest for the world. Then this is in the car. Of course, there will you have to drive the car, and that is the DC to AC converter for that. Now you have two wheelers, three wheelers and small, very small pickups. All these are in Asia. These are big, big, big markets. They're not sexy markets, okay? <laughs> but they're really huge markets. And we are playing a big role in converting the Indian ecosystem into electric. Here's an example in Taiwan. If you go in Taiwan, there's a company called Gogoro. This is a battery station, uh, battery station. 
What you go here is you go there on your scooter when your battery runs out, you just pull out your battery, put it in here, take a battery and go. So in less than 30 seconds, you can switch out your battery. So it's it's faster than filling up your gas. So the it's it's this, by the way, this particular stuff where you see in Taiwan, behind it, behind each one of this is a gallium nitride based charger. So one of the things people think, oh, gallium nitride is cannot compete against silicon carbide. That's not right. Actually, gallium nitride is a higher performance semiconductor than silicon carbide. Here you can see gallium nitride compared to silicon carbide MOSFET and silicon carbide JFET. The losses of gallium nitride is 35% less than silicon carbide. And this is only based on physics. Our mobility is 2000, their mobility is 800. There's nothing you can do about it. And the, and this is where physics, if your technology can harness, can, can convert physics into functionality, physics always wins. Technology is what stops physics from becoming reality. So us working together between CACS and UCSP, we are in the technology piece. Let's take the physics and make it reality. That's the key. All right. This is short circuit capability is very important for a motor. That means if a motor freezes, then what happens is the current in the motor goes up. Don't have time to explain, but this is called back EMF. And when a motor is spinning, it does not take a lot of current. But the minute it stops, it takes a huge amount of current. So you have to be able to survive what is called a stall, the motor getting stuck. So gallium nitride now can do this for over three microseconds while the circuit can respond. Also, gallium nitride now is a 1200 volt technology. I'm now showing you the comparison between gallium nitride grown on sapphire versus silicon carbide. Gallium nitride on sapphire is a 1200 volt technology. You can see here. And at transform, you can show we made a converter 900 volts to 450 volts with the same performance as silicon carbide and obviously much cheaper because the cost of six inch sapphire is $65 today compared to six in silicon carbide, which is more than uh, 12 or $1,400. So we believe that in the future, gallium nitride will start displacing silicon carbide as a high power semiconductor, even in a car. <clears throat> and I'll, in the last few minutes I have, I'll talk about RF. RF is booming. In the old days, we were in from 600 megahertz to 2.5 gig, uh, gigahertz. Okay, but now what is that? That is 4G. Now 5G and 6G is coming. 6G is up at nine. 6G is at millimeter waves. That is 60 gigahertz, 94 gigahertz, 140 gigahertz, 140 gigahertz. And that is for streaming video at very high speed. In small domains like large conference rooms like uh like uh, big stadia and so on and so forth 5g is more remote that means this is not in confined spaces it's really to give bandwidth at to people in their phone all this by the way 5g is going to be either gan or silicon phase arrays right now 5g is gan if you go higher in frequency, funny enough, silicon actually becomes more attract, becomes not more attractive than GAN, but the attractiveness of silicon grows as you go higher in frequency because of a concept called MIMO, which is you use many, 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 many silicon uh, devices to give you the same power. But it's complicated. So GAN is actually simpler and provides more power. Again, because of this high mobility, the same property that gave you that high efficiency in power conversion gives you high efficiency in RF. It also makes things smaller. S size is a, is a big driver. 5G is very expensive to put in uh, the, to deploy. They are heavy, they, are, they, they produce a lot of heat, and they are very difficult to service. 
So if you make it small and efficient, it gets deployed easily. So what I'd like to talk about right now, just a few minutes, is where is what frequency bands are important for GAN. The next frequency band of importance is 28 gigahertz. What I'm showing here is the ab absorption in the air by water vapor. Water vapor and oxygen, they basically have vibration modes in the RF, in the microwave. You know, the way, because you're cutting, you know, you want to break uh, ammonia, say cracking ammonia, you're doing it in the UV. Microwave also can couple in and actually start vibrating. Here, what happens is you absorb energy. But at 5G, you get a minimum in the loss. Then at E-band, you get a minimum in the loss. So E-band radio is already being deployed. You know where? You'll see in the top of hills in the US, and I'm sure in, San, in Saudi Arabia, in the kingdom, you have big uh, dishes that communicate back and forth. Those are all being now converted to 80 gigahertz. They were originally at 20 gigahertz. Now they're all going to 80. So this switch to high frequency is happening as we speak. And so one, one of the things, again, I'd like to tell you is just think. Small, small, small. Okay. And, what, and the only way you can make things small is if they are efficient. Because when you make things small and they generate heat, it melts. So if you want to make things small, they have to be efficient. And what we are seeing now, and I'll show you very quickly, that we have now developed a technology called nitrogen polar GAN, which is the flip of GAN, where you instead of, um, Abdullah showed the picture of gallium polar GAN that we have developed under Cax. This is the opposite form of GAN. This is basically ALGAN at the bottom, GAN on top, not ALGAN on top and GAN at the bottom. This is the two deg is now sitting on ALGAN, not below ALGAN. These devices tend to have extremely high efficiency. So you can see here that the efficiency is extremely high compared to gallium polar GAN. Gallium polar GAN cannot even provide power above four watts per millimeter. So above four watts per millimeter, only nitrogen polar survives at very high efficiency. So what I'd like to do say in conclusion is that gallium nitride is actually going to serve the full space from low frequency to very high frequency. Some of it will be gallium polar, some of it will be nitrogen polar, but it will be all GAN. And so I'd like to finish with the state, with the following, uh, slide. Air conditioning and buildings. People are already looking at GAN. This is a big power consumption area. Communication, a lot of GAN. Renewable energy, a lot of GAN. Enphase, one of the biggest, uh, PV inverter makers in, in, in the U.S. announced they're going to switch all their product. 100% from silicon to GAN. They just announced it. Electrification of transport is now silicon carbide driven, but it will be GAN driven in the future. So I think that, you know, I'd like to just leave you with the following statement. Working together with CAXT, I believe that there is a very strong, as you can see from the talks given by Shuji, Steve, and hopefully by my talk, we have covered both electronics and photonics. Working with CAXT, we can develop a big technology space that is not just has, it doesn't have a lifetime of five years, but has a lifetime of over 50 years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Omish, for the interesting talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to reiterate what you have said, our center of excellence, the core responsibility of this center is just two things, local, uh, local uh, localization of new technologies like the ones you showed and Steve and Shuji showed, and also uh, the, the talent, talent development, which, you are, uh, which we are working with you uh, now for more uh, than 10 years. 
uh, yes. to send our students and researcher to get trained and uh, qualified on these uh, new students. Uh, I myself one one of them, but also many other uh, got their PhDs and training on MOSVD and other technologies at, at UCSB. So we are very keen to continue this uh, collaboration that has been uh, very, uh, very lucrative and for uh, for CAX. Uh, and also at the conclusion of this uh, symposium, I'm very uh, still, uh, although I am working at gallium nitride, but I'm still very uh, amazed at uh, how many technology can be covered by this uh, incredible yeah. uh, semiconductor material from wireless to high power to renewables to to lighting and uh, the displays communication and so on uh, so now i'll open the space uh, for uh, for questions from the from the audience i i will start myself for an old question for you shuji i never had the opportunity to ask you about this <laughs> So, uh, so when when I grow as a as an emulsivity grower, I characterize my materials with uh, with AFM, XRD, and uh, and these new new tools. At, at at your time, how did you characterize your ingan thin films? How, how uh, with BL, EL, or how how do how did you characterize the quality of your films without these tools? Oh yeah, ingan ingan is just a. Uh... We use uh, just a PL, PL, just, you know, just uh, using the helicopter laser, just we irradiate the helicopter laser, and just the blue emission appears oh, great, you know. <laughs> just <laughs> we don't, you know, write that, that, that uh, we doesn't, uh, that doesn't get the full spectrum, just uh, irradiate the laser, it become blue or green, oh, great, that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I, is a human eye is a monochromator, no? best monochromator, no? yeah, so. Yeah. So PL, you have PL and the micrometer, right? Yeah, yeah. PL, PL, PL. Uh, we just uh, purchased PL and the X-ray. That's it for measurement. Uh, or whole, whole measurement. Whole measurement is a just homemade equipment, no? Whole <laughs> measurement. Yeah, expensive. Just we purchased a, a PL and the X-ray. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Very, very interesting. I I'll just use this example for my engineers who keep asking for purchasing new expensive uh, characterization tools that yeah. you still get can, <laughs> yeah yeah the can no things, do things no, and develop no. things without the use of yeah. uh, uh, no uh, no yeah. we had no seams no tem no yeah i mean it, it never measured the dislocation at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's that's a, that's an amazing thing yeah uh, also i have a question uh, here for you uh, uh, so for for the audience, uh, you, if you uh, you can just type your uh, question in Arabic and I'll uh, translate it. So one question here is about the the table you showed, Steve, about the micro LED and how it compares to the OLED and the small LED. That it it all the micro LED beats them in almost everything: the operating uh, efficiency, the like, uh, power consumption, and lifetime. So. So what keeps micro LED from overtaking the display uh, market and beat the OLED on this? Yeah, that's a good question. It turns out it's uh, what I didn't get into. It's the actual mass assembly or mass transfer. So it's uh, it's the yield is not you need ninety nine point nine 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 percent yield. Currently, the yields about ninety eight percent. So as you know, you can't have a display with 2% burned out pixels, 1%, 2%. And so that primarily, it's not the material causing the problem. It's the actual placement of the micro LEDs, the assembly yield, so to speak. So there's various ways people are trying to do the assembly now. Um, you know, like I said, it is in production for the TV, large format TV, uh, where they, they actually go in and repair the pixel. But... When you have to do repair it, it makes costs go up. So, so two things that that manufacturing yield influences the cost, which in turn is keeping it from the market in limited applications. Uh, for example, for that large uh, Samsung, uh, the wall TV uh, that was uh, like 300 inches by 600 inches, uh, the cost is about a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so, so even though it's a great display. It's the, the the assembly yield and the mass production. So that's what most companies are 
scrambling against is the the mass production costs and yield. Okay, interesting. Uh, also, a question is why the conventional size of the LED is 0.1 millimeter. Is that to keep the heat? Uh, I mean, to solve the heat problem? Or... Yeah, no, no, that was more developed by, it was a kind of a standard size uh, going back to 1988 even. Uh, it turns out that's, a, that's kind of the size that gives you enough light to do light bulb or indicator bulbs with. So you need to assemble of nowadays about 30 of those LEDs to make an LED light bulb. And that is also driven by the fact that what I didn't go into is that the efficiency peaks at around 20 amp per square centimeter. And because the efficiency peaks there, that kind of drives what the size you need for an LED light bulb is. So it's a combination of that uh, uh, the efficiency is peaking uh, for the, the right current density at around that size. Uh, so for the application of the LED light bulb, filament LED bulb in particular, they they actually were at a millimeter by millimeter, but they actually went back down to 200 micron by 500 micron was it, because it turns out that's the peak in a efficiency. And so in terms of size and cost. So it, is, it was a combination of a couple different efficiencies. The cost efficiency and the light efficiency drove that cost. Just like in the display, what we're going to see is that the smaller is probably going to turn out to be the better. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, I also have a, a question for Professor uh, Omish uh, Mishra. Uh, do you see gallium nitride amplifiers working at 300 gigahertz in the near future? And what can, where is that question? Okay. What can, uh, so for the for the audience, Professor Omish, can you answer that uh, question? Yes, uh, uh, th thank you very much for the question. Um, will will gallium nitride penetrate three hundred gigahertz applications? Not in the near future. I would say in the after about five to seven years is when we will get there. The, uh, our focus at the moment is uh, threefold. One is to <laughs> maximize the efficiency at ninety four gigahertz and below maximize the efficiency because the government in the US is not focusing on power, but focusing on efficiency because deployment of a system is now, the, the cost of the deployment is not the system so much. It is the system, of course, but system plus all the backup that you need to cool the system. I mean, if you see a picture of a radar deployed in by the Saudi armed forces or wherever, You'll see there's the radar, and then behind it will be a big refrigerator truck. Behind the big refrigerator truck will be many, many, many diesel trucks, which are basically to, to provide the fuel to run the refrigerator. So if you look at the deployment of a radar, it actually, you get a, you deploy the radar, you deploy the, <laughs> the refrigerator, you deploy the trucks. It becomes very difficult. So we are focusing on efficiency so that we can actually de decrease the cost of deployment. Hence, our focus at frequency is less than 300. Answer to your question is yes, we can get to 300 gigahertz. I, but the focus is now less than 300, but we can get there. I think in five to seven years, we'll, we will be there, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, if there is any more question, we have one more space for one time for one more question. It's now uh, 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 five minutes to finish and uh, if there is no more question I will just conclude here uh, thank you all for you uh, the speakers who have uh, dedicated their time and uh, shared their knowledge and wisdom with us here uh, very nice uh, talks and, uh, and uh, we conclude now uh, our, uh, our, uh, our year Happy year now with the first optically bumped laser and uh, the uh, ultra high uh, hemp mobility that uh, our team uh, at UCSB just demonstrated. And also with the first high power blue LED uh, just uh, fabricated last week at uh, CAX uh, Clear Room. And we're looking now for fabricating our the high power UV laser and blue laser here at um, at CAX with collaboration uh, with uh, our um, uh, UCSP team. And um, yeah, we will see we will see you all uh, together uh, next year at uh, the Saudi Semiconductor Forum that will be held at CAX next May 
uh, inshallah, May 2024. May 24th, you said? Yeah, May 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 2020, 2024 at CAX. Okay, that May. will be... Are, yeah. are the dates are the dates set yet? Not yet. I'll, Not I'll, yet. I'll, okay. I'll send it immediately once I receive oh. it. Okay. okay, thank you. There is a there is a conference in May called CS Man Tech, which I have to attend. So I'll let you know that day. But okay, but, okay, okay. Yeah, okay thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for uh, coming. Thank the yeah. audience. Thank yeah. the Academy for supporting yeah. this uh, seminar and symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.